And, you know, I'm, I'm excited to talk about a, a crop that is, I'm passionate about, that is a cowpea. Uh, so why cowpea? Well, I will tell you that cowpea is a very resilient uh, uh, legume that provides the main source of, of dietary protein for millions of people in the world, especially in sub-Saharan Africa, and cash income to smallholder farmers. So it's a really important legume for food security. And here on the top, you can see some pictures from West Africa that were taken from my colleagues. So also it's grown in many other parts of the world, including South America, um, Asia, Southern Europe, and here in the United States. In the U.S., it's mostly grown in the southern states and, and in California, um, but it's also starting to be noticed in other parts of the, of the U.S., including here in, in Colorado, because of the potential it has as an alternative crop to improve cropping systems. So this is what we are going to talk about today. I hope it's, you find it interesting. So this is the outline of my talk. I'll start with some background about cowpea. Then uh, I'll talk about... okay. I'll talk about briefly genomic resources uh, for the crop and, and the germ plants that we have for cowpea. And then we'll go into the fun part on the potential of cowpea as an alternative crop uh, in Colorado. That's where I will spend most of my talk. And then we'll go over the, the experiments that I had last year in the 2019 season and the, my 2020 field experiment uh, this year. So they're gonna be good. Okay, oops. Here you go. So before starting, I wanted to, to tell you a little bit more about myself because I'm a new member of Colorado State. Uh, I'm originally from Spain, uh, where I did my PhD uh, on barley genetics. Uh, so barley was my first crop. Then I moved to the very one of the warmest places probably in, in the US, that is in Minnesota. Uh, very nice people though. And at the University of Minnesota, I, I, I work on barley genetics and genomics as well. And um, after I think I saw enough snow, after five years there, um, I decided to move to, to, I got a position at the University of California, Riverside. That was pretty warm actually. So, and then in Riverside, when I started to, to, to be uh, involved with, uh, to be, First exposed to, to cowpea research. And, and honestly, this really got me, really excited me uh, because of the importance of legumes uh, in the cropping system, and also for, for human and animal health. So, and especially this crop that is so important for food security. And um, I use it Riverside, they had uh, my group there had big collaborations in uh, uh, international collaboration, especially with West Africa. So I gained a lot of international experience there uh, in Riverside. And uh, there was also a small breeding program, but I was not uh, doing the breeding. So I was always more from the gen in the genetic side of things, okay? So, so you know where I come from. I was providing support to the breeding program there in, in, in California and also to the West breeders, uh, to the breeders in West Africa. Um, and, and then I moved in February 2019 to, to, to Fort Collins. I got a position here. And unexpectedly, as, as you will see later, I continue working on, on cowpea. And uh, I'm doing more field work now than ever in my life. So I'm learning a lot from colleagues, from my collaborators, you know, growers, really. But, uh, you know, it's, it's been really fun because it's what I want to be doing right now. So there's a little bit of, okay, is it moving? Hmm. Okay, here we go. So let's start with some background about cowpea. So what's cowpea? Uh, the scientific name is Vigna wiculata. Uh, in the US, we mostly know it as a black eyed pea or southern pea because that's mostly the, the, the main type of, of seed that we grow here. So this kind of cream and white uh, seed with a black eye. Uh, some pink eye varieties are also very popular in the South. And, and cowpea is a traditional, uh, is part of the traditional cuisine of the South. And, and actually legend says that the eating black eyed peas uh, on New Year's Eve brings good luck. And, and a lot of seed is, is sold for the New Year's market here in the US. And the crop originated in Africa. Uh, and from there it moved to all other continents. Uh, it arrived in the US uh, following two routes. Um, it was brought to the southern st uh, states by the African slaves in the 1700s. And they grew cowpea uh, not only for the grain, but also to enrich the soil and uh, to control weeds. And cattle used to graze on, on, on cowpea, and that's where the name comes from of cowpea. And uh, also, uh, there's another route of entry to the US that we discovered recently is that the, 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 the cowpeas arrived in the area of California with the Spanish missions. Okay, so that was really nice to discover. 
And the um, cowpea is a warm season legume, as you can see here in this, in this uh, figure, in this graph. So here the warm season legumes are at the bottom, if you see my mouse here. Very important uh, crops in these warm season legumes. Uh, for example, soybean, you know, pigeon pea, common bean, and cowpea. So cowpea is closely related with common bean, uh, which is uh, Fasciolus vulgaris, that you can see here. And also, of course, two other bigness species, for example, mug bean and natsuki bean, uh, to cite some. And from the genetic size of things, um, just so you know, it's a cowpea is a diploid with 11 chromosomes and it self-pollinates, which is nice and is easy to work with. Okay, just so you get an idea of uh, the production of cowpea, where cowpea is produced in the world. Uh, this is a map here on the right of the world uh, of the cowpea grain production in the world. These are the averages for the last 10 years. And here are some numbers on the left uh, for 2016. And as you can see clearly, um, Africa is the major producer, especially West Africa, major producer of, of cowpea in the world. It's also the major consumer of cowpeas. Uh, Brazil is not listed here, you see it in the square here, I mentioned, uh, because um, uh, you don't get the numbers for cowpea from Brazil because they report cowpeas together with other beans, so you cannot get specific numbers. But Brazil is the second largest producer of, of cowpeas in the world. They also eat a lot of cowpeas there. And then you have some production in, 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 in Asia, in the US, and in Europe. And just to provide some information here, uh, just so you know, in the US, cowpea covers more than 250,000 hectares, that are more or less over 600,000 uh, acres, I believe, from the 30s to the 1960s. And, and then after this, you know, um, soybean happened, and then soybean started to replace cowpea in, in the fields of the South. And, uh, but I heard some colleagues saying that, you know, as the, the climate gets more extreme and in the case, uh, you know, in the unexpected event of, for example, an epidemic that can affect and limit the soybean production, cowpea will come back strong in, in those states because also it's a more diverse and, and resilient legume than, than soybean. Okay, so cowpea is really in my opinion, a very special crop. It's one of the most uh, versatile and, and resilient food legumes. Um, as a food crop, cowpea is a good source of, of uh, protein, minerals, uh, vitamins, as a folic acid, and, and, and dietary fiber. Uh, it can be eaten as a grain, uh, as a dry grain, a fresh grain, uh, also the, the tender leaves and the immature pods, as you can see in this in these pictures on the right, it can be eaten as a vegetable. So you have ever seen in this, this Chinese long beans in the market, they are cowpeas actually, but they selected for long pods. And uh, I also wanted to mention here that, uh, you know, in the South, there's a big market for, quite a large market for, for fresh cowpeas. And here you see some pink eye. And, and I've heard from colleagues that they, you know, growers get quite a lot of money for them. It's a very profitable vegetable. It's like, a, they get like $6 per pound or something like that. So the most profitable and most famous in the farmer's markets after tomato, apparently. Um, so, um, cowpea is also uh, used as a green or dry fodder for animal livestock. It's very nutritious uh, fodder. Uh, and also some farmers use it as a green manure and cover crop to improve soil fertility and avoid erosion. But I think cowpea is mostly known because of the good adaptation it has to heat and drought and poor soils. And that's what makes cowpea successful in the arid and semi-arid regions of the world with other uh, other, other crops don't perform well. So it's definitely the most resilient among the major uh, crop legumes. And uh, just so you know, you know, until recently it was considered an orphan crop, uh, meaning that it lacked the genomic resources that other crops, the like major crops had, like for example, soybean or corn. And um, although this is not the topic, you know, of the, of the, of the, um, of the, of the talk, it's really important. I want you to know that uh, having genomic resources is really important because it allows uh, to increase the speed and the precision of, of crop improvement and breeding. Okay, so, and then, you know, there was considerable, considerable funding, as I write here, from the Villa Marinda Gates Foundation and Feed the Future through USAID. And now we have uh, world-class genomic resources. And I, and I say they are really, really important. It's really important to have them for, for this crop. And so what are these uh, genomic resources, briefly? We have a reference genome sequence, so you know, for the for the crop. We sequence uh, elite uh, variety from from Nigeria, West Africa. It was released in 2019, so last year, and um, this enables really progress in cowpea research and breeding because you can track your traits in the genome, you can develop markers, and then you can follow up those markers when you make crosses. So it really, really helps. And other things that help a lot, other re genomic resources that help. For example, we have a genotyping array, which is a 
chip of Illumina that allows uh, you know you know you know getting like uh, fifty thousand markers at a time from each variety. So those are SNPs, which are single nucleotide polymorphisms. So basically, differences between uh, of one nucleotide between different varieties. And 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 so using the chip, bottom line is that you can know the genetics of your lines pretty fast and pretty easily. And then we have also sequenced recently another six genomes because you know cowpea is a very diverse crop, so having just one genome sequence from West Africa was not enough. So we chose other varieties from around the world, including a California elite cultivar that is is widely grown here in the U.S. So we have that now. And that brings me to the germplasm, which is basically the raw material that we have to improve the productivity and the quality of, of the crop. And, and we are really lucky with, with uh, in cowpea because uh, cowpea is a very diverse crop. And although most uh, cowpeas that are grown in the US are black eyed peas, uh, there, are, there is a lot of diversity in seed coat colors and patterns that you can see, for example, in these figures on the, on the top left. Um, uh, also, um, cowpea varieties have diverse growth habits. And there are uh, bush types, like this one on the bottom right here, that you know, are preferred for direct harvest and, and grain production. But you also have binding types that are usually preferred for, for cover cropping or, or, or forage. And uh, as you can see also here on the top right uh, uh, figure uh, picture, uh, we have a lot of diversity in, in, in maturity, flowering times, and, and uh, usually for, for Colorado, you know, early maturity varieties are preferred for grain production. But also, you know, like here in this picture in the center, I don't know if you see this one or here on the bottom left, there are some varieties that are photoperiosensitive, meaning that they don't flower or flower very late in the under the long summer days of, of Colorado. And they keep growing, you know, like putting leaves and they are super strong. Some of them are really, really strong. So I imagine this could be really good varieties for, for forage, for example. And yeah. So a lot of uh, diversity really to exploit on, on, on cowpea. And, and where do we find this diversity? So there are also we are lucky with cowpea because there are very good uh, germ plus collections of cowpea in the world that are maintained in gene banks. And these are the three largest collections in the world. The largest collection is, is held at the International Institute of Tropical Agriculture, IITA, in Nigeria. They have more than 15,000 uh, cowpea varieties there. The second largest is at the USDA in Griffin, Georgia. Uh, they have more than 8,000 varieties there. And, and uh, at the University of California, Riverside, where I used to work, they have a collection of over 5,000 varieties there. So there's, of course, overlap between collections. So, you know, it's not that you keep adding. So um, obviously, as you can imagine, these collections are pretty hard to maintain. And also, you know, and to evaluate. Imagine you want to evaluate this, this diversity and you have to plant 5,000 uh, varieties, you know. Who has the resources to plant 5,000 or 50,000, but it is not me for sure. So usually what you tend to do is to, to, to develop subsets okay, of these collections and trying to represent the diversity of the entire collection. And that's what you evaluate. And here I wanted to mention a subset uh, that I call the UCR mini core. This is a collection uh, that uh, is, I have affection for it. And also um, it's a collection that is relevant for the work that I'm doing here. Okay, so this I wanted to say a little bit more. So this is a subset, this mini core, of the collection that is held at the University of California Riverside, where I was working before. And I developed this subset. And uh, luckily, it came with me to Colorado. And I will explain you how now next. Okay. So what is this UCR mini core that I'm using? Well, it's a set of 368 uh, varieties from 50 countries that try to represent the, the, the worldwide diversity of cultivated cowpea. And uh, so this is a world map here in this, in this main figure. And where you, wherever you see a pie, that means that we have varieties from that country in the collection. Okay? And the size of the pie is uh, proportional to the number of varieties that have from that country. The colors mean in different gene pools, so you don't have to know the details because it's kind of genetic details. But uh, what basically means is that when you see a pie with a lot of colors, means that there's those varieties from that country are more diverse. Okay? There's more diversity in the, in the varieties that I got from this country, that country. And here on the on the on the right, you can see some uh, some pictures from from varieties in this in this mini core. Uh, you see a lot of diversity in pod and, and seed types and colors. Also here at the bottom, some uh, diversity in, in in plant architectures in, in maturity times. This is me in the Coachella Valley at the Coachella Valley in California, the desert basically. This crop really loves the desert for some reason. It's really really hot there and pretty dry, but they likes it and uh, grows really well. Used to grow very well in Coachella. 
And I, I, I developed this collection as I, as, I, as I told you, I was really careful developing it. So I, you know, from all this variety, I only selected one seed. I only took one seed of each of these varieties and I planted it in a pot. Okay, I, the plants were growing. I collect this leaves from that plant and I genotype those with this chip that I told you about that has 50,000 markers. So we know the genetics bottom line of each of these varieties. And then that plant produced seed. I collect the seeds from that plant and that's my mother plant. Okay, so I have the information of the genotype and I have the seeds from that plant. And that's for maintaining purity and for all the application purposes, really, really important. Okay, so it makes it more useful. And then we keep increasing only seeds from that plant, from original plant. Okay, that's we make increases in the greenhouse, and that's why we keep this how we keep this collection. So but when I came here, I was uh, conscious that this was a, a property of, of the University of California Riverside because I developed, I developed it when I was there. So, but, but the professor I used to work with uh, when I was there, it was nice enough that he drove all the way from, uh, from, uh, from Riverside, California to, to Fort Collins and brought seeds from that mother plant with, with, with him to share some with me. And I, you know, he, he knew that this collection, I put a lot of effort in this collection. And also it's pretty important when you are, you know, you're in a new position to, to, to have some germ plus to start working with. So this has been uh, proven to be very, very useful, actually, very good thing to, to do. So I'm really thankful to him. Okay, so now the fun part of the talk, okay? Cowpeas and Colorado, guys. You're gonna get excited. So I'll tell you first about the experiments that I had in 2019 when I just arrived, and my 2020 experiments at two locations in Akron and, and Fort Collins. Okay, so before telling you about the experiments, I want to tell you a little bit about my Colorado story. Okay, so before coming here, I'm going to be honest with you, I never thought I would be working on cowpea really for Colorado because I thought it was a colder climate. I had imagined you know, Colorado, the mountains, snow, I don't know, like it gets pretty hot here in the summer, but I thought that cowpea would not grow well here in, in Colorado. So, um, and I thought, how can I use really my, my, my expertise, right, to, to, to help Colorado agricultural system because I really wanted to help uh, Colorado uh, farmers. So then I thought, initially thought of working on common bean because as I said at the beginning, it's a crop that is really, really similar to, you know, pretty close related with, with, uh, with uh, cowpea. And this is what I want you to, to see here, to some, learn some genetics here. So it's a very intuitive plot. So here on the right, you have 11 chromosomes of, of, common, of cowpea here, VU1 to 11 here. And then on the left, you have the chromosome for common bean, uh, PV1 to 11. Okay, so when two sequences are very similar, almost similar, you have a line connecting them. So what you see clearly is that even some chromosomes are, have one to one relationships so between uh, cowpea and, and common beans. So it's really, really, you know, this maintain uh, the, 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 the sequences, the, the similarity of sequences and the, and the order between cowpea and, and common bean. That's what we call uh, synthetic. So really synthetic, really good. And that, that's important because then resources of one crop can help the other crop. And that's what I thought I, was be doing, I would be doing. And, and I, got, I was lucky to get some support from the Colorado Dry Bean Administrative Committee at the beginning. Uh, it was a travel grant to basically know the, uh, the main players uh, um, in the dry bean industry. And uh, I arrived here, I think it was my first day of the year was uh, February 1st. And on the 10th, I think it was, so kind of mid-February, uh, I went to, to Scott's Bluff in, in Nebraska to attend the, the, the Nebraska Bean Day. It was very, very awful who, who took uh, me with, with him. And I thought about, you know, learning more about who's there, you know, what are the crops. And, and, and I was surprised. I was uh, there sitting and I listened to two talks about cowpea. And I thought, cowpeas in Nebraska, right? And I was lucky also, I made a comment, oh, wow, you know, cowpeas. And, and I used to work on cowpea. And on that same table, I was sitting the, this, this, this guy here, Jason Webb, who is a field representative at Trinidad Benham. And he actually got excited and told me, yeah, I, I work for Trinidad and, and I handle all the, the fields of black eyed peas in Colorado and, and, and Nebraska. And so, you know, and, Cowpea actually is a new crop in, in Colorado and, and Nebraska, but it's growing well, growers are happy. Some of them are even you know, growing uh, cowpea for three years now, and uh, we are learning about the management, but it does well under dry land. It, it requires less water under irrigated conditions. So, you know, it has a lot of potential. Like, you know, and we should keep talking about it. And, and then after that, and, you know, we kept talking and, and kept collaborating. And, and, you know, since then I thought, okay, oops, supposed to come something, yeah. But about cowpea, right, for, for a Colorado cropping system. So uh, since then, I've been you know, collaborating with Jason and, and trying to, and I have also other colleagues that I will tell you later that also believe that cowpea can be a great crop uh, for, for Colorado. So, 
yep, this is uh, my story. And this is just some pictures from some uh, growers fields that I visited last last year. So pretty impressed I was. I went with Jason and he took me to two uh, growers fields from Trinidad. Uh, one was south of Sterling. I think the, it was something Barton, the, the family name of that farm. I was really impressed, a very nice uh, field. That was a grow cowpeas under dryland conditions. And then another field was uh, the North Sterling, and, 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 and this was an uh, irrigated field. Usually, the amount of water uh, is about 11 inches of water per year that uh, they, they, they put, but really, uh, I've talked to Jason about this uh, often, and, and we don't know really what is the optimal amount of water for this crop to grow. And, and this, you can really, really easily reduce uh, cowpea yields if you add too much water, and, and also you add too much fertilizer. So that is really tricky, uh, cowpea. It doesn't like fertilization and water, right? It doesn't like input. So that's kind of a good thing after all. <laughs> and main, main issue here is that, uh, you know, only two uh, varieties, two black eye varieties uh, are cor currently grown or have been tested in Colorado. Those are California black eye five and California black eye 46, CB5, CB46. And, and CB46 is a new variety, but as you know, this is a variety that was released by UC Davis in the eighties, okay, 1980s. So these are all varieties. Uh, I feel there is quite a lot of improvement to, to do here if and pretty fast if, um, if we have the resources to do so. So, so imagine when I told Jason, wow, I, I have a collection of 368 varieties at Colorado State and he opened the eyes like, wow. So um, from here you can guess what's the first thing I did that summer, right? I didn't have a lot of resources, I just arrived, but I thought, okay, I'm gonna put this uh, mini core on the ground and I want to see how it does, you know, if there is some potential good traits here for Colorado, what, what is, is it doing here in, in Colorado? So that's what I did. Uh, I did experiments here at, uh, at the CSU's Agricola, Agricultural Research Development and Educational Center in Colarbeck. And I put uh, all the varieties and both under irrigated and non-irrigated conditions because I want to see the potential for dry land also. And uh, I had, of course, limited uh, seed supply because I got some little bottles from, from Riverside. So I planted 50 seeds per, per variety uh, in single rows, only one replicate. I used CB46 and CB5 at checks. The irrigated part of the field uh, received like about one inch of water per week. And the non-irrigated plots didn't have any additional uh, water. The total rainfall that uh, last year was 3.9 uh, inches at, uh, in, at the station in Arvec. Although it was a very, so it was quite a lot of moisture before planting because you remember there was a very wet spring. And I, you know, that was not a very fortunate year for me. <laughs> well, I thought last year that was an unfortunate year. This year, after the year, I think that maybe it's the way it is in Colorado, okay? So now I'm starting to change my mind. So that's, you get a, either one form of extreme event or another or a combination of, of a few of them. So, the, but I planted really, really late. That was June 17th. And that's usually a cowpiece planted at the end of, um, the end of May, beginning of uh, June, um, but it was really wet spring, a lot of rain, we couldn't enter the field. Then of course, you know, all the crops had to be planted in Ardeck. I was not, I was one of the new arrivals. So, you know, corn was planted first. At the end, it was really super late, but we made it. It was okay. Jason came here to, to help, has been a great collaborator and friend. Um, so then after that, I don't remember in 2019, but it was freezing cold. It was really cold. And I thought, so it was rain, cold. And I thought, oh my God, this cowpea doesn't like cold and it's gonna die there before, you know, probably germinated this below ground and it, it died. But, you know, then there was this crash, then you get the sun and you get this big crash that I had never seen before in the soil. And then, you know, I thought maybe they die inside, but they, they made it, they actually brought the crash and came out. So I thought, okay, well, we saved somehow this experiment although it's late. And then we got this hailstorm on July 5th and there was the size of the hail. It was really total devastation. It was just, you know, decapitation of plants. I thought that was the end. I literally cried. I thought I put most of my seeds on the ground. I lost them and, you know, um, that's it. Okay, so that's it for the season. But the plants recovered better than what I thought. Of course, there was a lot of gaps in the field and, you know, I couldn't, you know, I could not score yield that that that, uh, that season, but still I could score germination rate bigger. I had the flowering time scores and, and also for those plants that produce seed, uh, I had 100 seed weight. Just so, you know, like about half of the collection never even, I mean, they made flowers, but they never makes it to produce seeds and some of them never even flower, maybe 100 of them never flower here. Okay, so this is more or less the numbers. I have probably 150 that are good that they actually produce seed under these conditions. 
And also Jason and I went there and took observations of performance, you know, like, okay, this plant looks like it's producing quite a lot on, and, and plant architecture. They are not really like, you know, they cannot substitute real, real uh, trials and, and, and yield data, but they have been proven uh, useful. Okay, so the 2020, this is kind of a very nice, um, I think uh, you are gonna enjoy this, uh, this experiment. So uh, I'm gonna mention first the experiments that I had at Akron uh, under dry land. Uh, because I think they are more interesting. And, and then I will mention the, 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 the field trials here at, uh, at um, Fort Collins, kind of similar to what I had last year. Okay, so Akron. Um, uh, the main purpose of this experiment is really to, to know if cowpea can become a, a fallow replacement crop in Colorado dryland cropping systems. And, and um, uh, I put here my colleague, uh, Jerry Johnson, he really motivated me to, to do this experiment. And, has motivated me to, to continue working on copy, you know, since I arrived. So thank you, Jerry. And uh, you ever listened to this. <laughs> and um, and uh, so he has explained to me that how replacing the fallow period that the, before uh, winter wheat could have a huge economic and, and environmental impact because of course it would provide an additional crop to, 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 to farmers, right? But also it potentially reduce soil erosion and, and increase uh, nitrogen and carbon availability. So, you know, that would be really good. But finding an alternative crop to summer fallow has been uh, so far a difficult task because of the lack of alternatives that fit into crop rotation and also leave enough moisture in the soil uh, for, for the subsequent uh, winter crop, uh, winter uh, wheat crop. So we thought, okay, cowpea, you know, um, since it's well adapted to drought, it doesn't require a lot of water, maybe it has a chance. So this is what we have been uh, trying to test here. So we had a replicative field trials at the USDA Central Great Plains Station in Akron. And uh, we used 19 uh, varieties that I selected based on the experiment I just mentioned about. So this entire collection here in Ardeck, okay? So based on the observations, we chose 19 varieties. And then um, we increased seeds during the, during the winter and then we planted them in, 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 in Accra this summer. And then winter wheat has been planted after the cowpea trial. I also partnered with two great colleagues, uh, professionally also nice people, uh, Megan Szypanski and Mike Wilkins. Uh, I have very nice colleagues, so that, that's something really good of here. And uh, so, so the idea is to, to really see the effects of cowpea varieties could have on, relative to fallow on soil nitrogen, moisture, and microbiome composition. And then on the wheat uh, and the, the yield and quality of the, of the wheat crop. Okay, so for that purpose, we have some fallow plots as control. And uh, we collected samples from each plot, a copy planting, and also prior to we planting. And so this is just basically an overview of the experiment, and I'm gonna tell you the details. Okay, so copy was planted on May 27th. Okay, when there was some moisture on the on the on the ground, um, we had three replications uh, of each uh, copy variety at about 50,000 seeds per acre of density. Uh, we had a follow plot within each, uh, each, uh, each, uh, each block or the three blocks uh, as control. Uh, we then apply any fertilizer. We apply Spartan Elite uh, on May 29th uh, for weed control. And then, you know, at the end of the field, some common beans, pinto beans in particular, were planted. Okay. And uh, this was something that was not planned. And they, they, they decided to do at this Akron station. I'm really, really thankful for that because. Um, because uh, you know it's something that we have also you know it's always good to have a, a, a crop for comparison so it has been I will show you some pictures have been useful and here I really want to thank uh, you know Sally Jones Diamond and Annette Asphel I mean they 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 work with uh, with Jerry at the crops testing program at CSU they have been handling the planting harvesting you know they provide great input um, keep an eye on the field I'm really really thankful for having them and they have been really really nice people and really useful and also I want to thank Joel and uh, Joel is a is a I think a water resource specialist I believe I think I've seen you there so speak if I'm not correct <laughs> and then he has been also uh, extremely helpful always keeping an eye sending me pictures providing great input so I'm really thankful for the people that, that work there I, would, I could not have done this without them, really, because I don't have the experience and the expertise. So, on some pictures here on the 1st of June, some cowpeas by then had emerged pretty dry. Okay? Um, 
And uh, this is just the, just the beginning of a very, another challenging season somehow. So the Colorado seasons. Okay, so of course we had a big storm, right? You always had to get a big storm somehow. Uh, so I think on June 8th in the night, a uh, big storm hit Akron. It was a hail storm with, some, with over 100 miles per hour winds. I think this, those are called derecho thunderstorms and apparently are very, very rare events, but they happen. So it's kind of a chain of, of, of storms and uh, like tornado type of winds. And of course that damaged the, the plants that had emerged as you can see here, the picture of the left. Okay. And um, this is some, then what happened is, of course, a full inch of water uh, fell with that uh, storm. Then you have the sand, then you get this crust uh, form in the, in the soil that, you know, it's kind of typical crust in Colorado. And then uh, we were worried that, 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 that um, the, the seedlings that had not emerged uh, were going to have troubles. We were considering even breaking the grass, but at the end, uh, they were making it. So at the end, we let it be. And as you can see here, these are pictures of the June 12th that of cowpeas breaking the crust. Okay, but I think the main issue this, this season was the, the drought. Uh, this is one of, one of the driest summers on record. The total rainfall at the station was 2.8 inches. And, um, you know, really, I think it was actually drier in that, re, in that Akron station than anywhere else. So all the storms were going and I was just following them, following them, tracking them, and then suddenly they just going around. I was just driving crazy this summer. It's like, wow, it's like not, not a single storm that falls, you know, from Akron. But anyway, so there was really the total 2.8 and that was basically fell into two storms. Uh, there was one storm, the, the storm at the beginning of the summer that was like about an inch. And then there was another storm, I think August 5th or something like that. And there was another full inch. Okay, so not much rain in July, actually it was, pretty, pretty dry, dry July, really below average. And I went there on the 23rd, I was worried. I thought, uh, so actually we had the, the we had this cowpies as you can see here under the linear, because we thought in the case, you know, there is such a big drought, we had to rescue the experiment. At the end, we didn't have to. So, um, so I went on the 23rd. I was expecting to find the plants wilting, yellowing, honestly, and I, I like what I saw when I arrived, I was really happy to see the plants were green, all the varieties were holding well, and I was really happy about that. Then, uh, you know, these are pictures later in the season, this is a picture of August the 3rd, just before the, the second storm, so still no, no, no water. Um, the old, by then, most of the varieties had flower and, and they were set in pots, so pretty lo nice looking uh, plants. And this is a picture here on August uh, 17th. Okay, so here you have, uh, you know, the plot. And here are some gaps. It's just, I think the storm that, you know, I cannot be certain, but I think the, the, the storm uh, damaged more the plants that, that had come out already. So, you know, that the ones that didn't emerge. So that's possible that that's why we, we saw some gaps in some of the plots. Maybe these are varieties that emerged earlier. And I don't have data of that, so I cannot know for certain. But, but there are, you know, some, some plots had, quite a lot of gaps as you can as you can see here but you know there's no perfect trial I still think that that storm if that storm had hit the station later in the season you had been devastated with the, with those big winds okay so anyway very happy about the performance of cowpea and these stream drought conditions I mean to tell you the truth I would have preferred a more normal year right especially for the purpose of testing cowpea uh, as a fallow replacement uh, crop because really I mean there's not much moisture anyways for any crop but you know I think there are some advantages of, of testing a crop under very extreme conditions because you you also see the, the potential of the crop and and also you always learn something and, and you know something that I really learn is that really cowpea outperform common bean and it is dry land conditions and, and that was something really, you know, that I was really shocked to see. These are pictures that I speak by themselves. They were taken uh, on, 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 on uh, August 3rd. And uh, this is the beginning of the field. The cup is here, flowering, setting pots. And these are the, the pinto beans that were at the end of that same field. Um, so, yeah, it was basically a core failure. They didn't produce any yield, uh, uh, pinto beans. And then the day before harvesting, uh, we went to, to, to Akron to, with Mike Wilkins, with uh, his student, uh, Amelia Nelson, and my rich associate, Amanda, also Jerry, uh, Jerry sorry, um, Jason came to help also. And, and the purpose was to collect rhizosphere samples for microbiome analysis. 
and this was, I mean, this box, it was really hard, <laughs> I tell you. So the soil was super hard. So the, uh, the, the rhizosphere is the, the part of the soil that surrounds the, the, the plant roots. So that's the soil that we had to collect. And uh, for that, we had to pull out those plants, you know, dig and pull them out. And that seems like an easy task, right? With normal conditions, but it was so dry and the soil was so hard. It was really difficult to pull them out. And then, then you had to be lucky to have roots with some soil attached, right? Like in this picture here on the right, so that we could collect this. But in many cases, in most of the cases, you know, it was so dry that then as soon as you pull out the, 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 the plant with the root, with some roots, then the, the soil completely separated from the roots and, you know, disintegrated. And then you had to keep dig uh, digging. So really, after that day, I have a bigger appreciation for soil microbiology. It's really, anyway, so it was really, really hard work. And, and I wish I could, so the purpose of the study, yeah, just to, 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 to say it, it would be to know the impact that cowpea plant could have on the composition of soil microbial, uh, microbial communities, okay, and the potential benefit that that would have for the subsequent uh, wheat crop. So it's going to be really interesting. So we're going to sequence, uh, you know, the taxa that are in those samples and then see that there are differences between varieties and, 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 and also between uh, comparing with, with the fallow uh, and see then afterwards that's correlated with the the yields that we are we are seeing and the difference in yields in weight but uh, you know because of the covid situation uh, it's difficult now to 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 get any kit uh, for sequencing for for extracting amplifying and and, and and sequencing so uh, this has not been uh, we have not been able to complete this so this is called 65 hello ah, yeah. okay so and this is going to be all done by the by the the lab of my wilkins Okay, so we harvested cowpea, uh, we directly harvested them uh, on August 28th. Um, that was a, a, we used a combine with a wheat header for harvesting, and um, we got seed weights from each of the plots. Okay, and this is the, the results that we got from these uh, cowpea, um, cowpea um, uh, trials. So this uh, figure here shows the distribution of, of grain yield for each variety. Okay, so you have here in the x axis. Access here, you have each of the of the copy varieties. Here, the control basically follow with zero yield. Uh, y axis uh, is the yield in pounds per acre. Okay, uh, so each of these bars is the um, the data from one of the replicates. You have the minimum, the maximum yield, the median, and the, this diamond here is the average. Okay, so you know. And what you see is that, of course, there is a variation between the different rep three replicates of the of the of each uh, variety. But also, it's, it's obvious that not all varieties perform equally, right? And some really perform really well, and some didn't perform very well. For example, so you get some numbers. The average uh, yield uh, per variety went from two only to uh, 40 for this variety here, okay, number 50, to up to almost 1.2 thousand pounds per acre for this variety here, okay? And um, something interesting. Uh, is that okay? This we had CD46, which is one of the commercial varieties that are grown in Colorado. The average for, for CD46 was uh, 780 pounds per acre, which is mostly kind of the average of the, of the entire you know, trial. But you can see that there are uh, other varieties that outperform CD46, which you know, is just only one experiment that there's uh, some potential here. Okay, so we have, for example, these two here that I would like to highlight. This one here. CP4906. This is a variety from Portugal and it did really well. Um, I mean, the average was almost 1.2 pounds per acre, but there is a plot that got, we got from a plot 1.7 uh, pounds per acre. So, you know, um, also it's a, I, I saw this one also um, um, coming up really nicely in the in the Arctic trials this year. So it's a variety to keep an eye on. And also this other variety, TV, uh, TVU 1811, this is a variety from Puerto Rico. Also did pretty well, quite stable between the different replicates here, the yields. This was about 11, uh, 1100 uh, pounds per acre. So I didn't show here, I, don't, I mean, I removed a, a picture because I thought it was gonna be too much, but I have flowering time data also. Some varieties flowered really early, between 47 days had already flowered. Some of them were up to 67 days. And I didn't see a very, any, very strong correlation between yield and flowering, uh, days to flower. So it is good because then you want to select a early, uh, early maturing variety, you are not gonna get a big penalty uh, for, for yield. All right, so it was good, promising. Um, 
Okay, then the, the day, uh, um, the, this on September, just before uh, before wheat planting, uh, Megan Sipanski went to, to Akron with, uh, with her uh, rich associate, James Hale. Uh, the purpose was to collect samples that will be used for moisture and, and, and available nitrogen analysis. Okay, so uh, samples uh, from each plot were collected using a hydraulic probe. And you see here also Joel helping. And um, the, the, for soil moisture, the, the samples were collected at three depths, 0 to 20 centimeters, 20 to 40 centimeters, and 40 to 80 centimeters. Okay. So uh, something to, 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 to mention here is that uh, Megan told me that uh, she noticed that in many of the, of the, on the plots, of the cowpea plots, uh, she saw cowpea roots below the 40 centimeters, which would be 16 inches, I believe. Okay, so below 16 inches, he saw in the last part of the of the of the of the soil uh, roots. That's probably one of the you know the reasons why cowpea is uh, more better adapted to to, to drought is because of the, the the deep root system that it puts. Uh, we don't have the nitrogen uh, data available yet, uh, but uh, Megan was nice enough to finish the soil moisture analysis last week during the break, and, and, and she shared the results with me, and I'm going to share them with you for this talk, okay? So that was determined by drying the sample of soil at 105 Celsius for 24 hours. And here you go. This is probably interesting for you. Um, so this is uh, here the graph on the right. It shows the soil moisture percentages, the averages for each of the varieties. And also here you have fallow. Okay. So each line is a variety and you have fallow. Okay. These are averages. And I don't have here the error bars because if, if, not, if you put the error bars, it gets really messy, the, the figure. So. And you have the three depths here on the y axis uh, 20 centimeters, 40, and 80. Okay. And it, it's obvious uh, by the results that, you know, cowpea obviously reduces as expected soil moisture relative to fallow that is, is here. Okay. That was uh, throughout the soil profile. However, you see variation in moisture use across uh, cowpea varieties. And for example, this one here, you see R24, uh, consistently used less water across the profile. Okay, than other varieties, for example. This one here, this variety number 47, this one in brown, it's kind of strange because for some reason, um, in, in all the reps, uh, Megan said that you use less water on the surface only. Okay, so I don't really have an explanation. It's not one of the best um, um, yielding varieties, that's for sure. So, yeah, but I don't really know why exactly. And um, so this is good. So meaning that, you know, We'll see how this relates with with uh, with with wheat, but we are seeing differences. And maybe a variety like this might not be the best uh, yielding, but maybe it would be the best one for fitting into the you know into the rotation and to replace fallow, right? Because maybe it's the one that generates less penalty for for um, for wheat. So we'll see now. Okay, we're gonna see what's the impact on wheat yields and if the productivity and profitability of the of the cowpea crop can offset a possible wheat yield reduction. So this is this is the question. Okay. All right, so then we planted the uh, wheat on September 18th. Um, the variety that we chose is, is 45 SF. This is one of the semi-solid stem uh, cultivars that was released by the, by the wheat program at CSU. And uh, we chose it because of the, the soft light problems that uh, were seen last, last, uh, last year in the, in, in the region, okay, just to be safe. And these are pictures uh, that uh, were taken on October 22nd of the of the field. Okay, so it looked like a good stand. So we hope uh, that we are going to get a good uh, wood wheat trial. So let's see. I'm, I'm honestly really excited to see what are going to be the yields, the quality, and how that relates with with uh, you know with the different cowpeas versus fallow. If that has any relationship with the you know, nitrogen composition of those plots with the microbiome composition, with the moisture, and, 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 and so on. So next year, I will have results for you. OK, so then just briefly about what I did uh, this year in Ardec. Again, what I did was to put the entire mini core collection in Ardec this year without hail. So that was really good. So I could get some data. Uh, so planted the entire collection, again, under irrigated and non-irrigated conditions. Um, 56 per accession, similarly, single rows. Um, this time I used CB5 only as a check, and, and planting day was better, it was June 5th, so it was, you know, like around where growers were planting this year. 
and uh, it's changed over last year. This year, the irrigated plots only received 0 0.5 inches of water per week. Uh, so that was a 50% reduction of, over last year's trial. And, uh, and this was, I started with one inch and after two weeks, I was going there, I would see the plants were unhappy in the irrigated part, only in the irrigated section. I know the soil was too wet and I, I reduced to 0 0.5 and never come back. So I think, you know, um, this was a better, also, I mean, the soil here in, in, in Fort Collins is more clay. It's true that it retains more water, but there was plenty of water for cowpea and it did pretty well. So the plants recovered after reducing the water and then did pretty well. So I never even increased. And it was pretty hot actually. So, so that was a, a change. And, and this is uh, why I think, you know, next thing to do really is we need, uh, I need some funding to do a proper experiment on, you know, with irrigation because, you know, irrigation uh, is part of the Colorado agriculture as well. And, uh, you know, although I'm focusing now more on dry land, I think it's important to know what is the optimal number, of, the amount of, of water that really cowpea needs and also you know, fertilizer would be another thing because if you add too much fertilizer, then the plants keep growing, put a lot of biomass, but they re the yields are reduced and also it's a pain to, 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 to harvest those. So, you know, it's, it's kind of tricky. You try to tend to put more inputs thinking that you're going to get it. You have them, right? You're going to get more yield, but with cowpea, you don't. So that, that's, uh, that's something that we have to, to figure out. I mean, management also. Okay, so the, um, the non-irrigated plots didn't receive any water and the total rainfall it was really low. You know, this was just before the freezing um, storm, this is no storm of September. That's what the, you know, the, the trial ended. And the total at the station was 1.74 inches for the entire season. And I can tell you that they had, uh, had also some nurseries of uh, common bean and had some common bean work. And, and there was a, a, a dry land nursery just sitting beside the, the, the dry land uh, part of the copy trial. And those are supposed to be varieties from all over the US from different breeding programs that are selected for drought tolerance. And they, we, what we harvested were like hands of pods, okay? Almost nothing. It was really, really dry in, in Ardex. So it was really tough for dry land. And, and, and what Cowpea did, as you can see here, I mean, this is the picture I took from the soil. The soil was cracking. It was really, really unbelievable. So plants had to be very stressed, but still the, 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 the trial looked pretty good. So this is the picture of the, of the non-irrigated part of uh, the field in our deck. Uh, these are my people. Here I have Amanda Ansberry, my research associate. Amazing, uh, I, I could not do anything without her. Brooke uh, is my uh, graduate student and I have Michael uh, Duffy also, he's an undergrad that is doing a practicum with me and is working on copy this, this semester. So they have been really helpful to collect data. Anyway, so, okay, so this is some data I wanted to show you. I score germination rate, bigger, days to flowering, usual things. So, so this year I, I, I took grain yield and hand seed weight as well from those that produce, uh, produce uh, enough um, grain. And um, I, the only problem that I have is that I don't have pounds per acre to show you because uh, we're supposed to have 50 seeds in each um, in each plot would be like around 40,000, uh, you know, um, seeds per acre kind of density. But the planter, I don't know, it was a lot of problems with the planter. I don't know because of the, 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 the different seed sizes between varieties. Some plots I ended up having six plants, okay, and maybe all together. And in some plots I ended up having 45 plants. So what I did was to calculate, you know, consultation with Jerry and, and Sally is calculated the yields per plant within each plot. So here, what you, you see here is the distribution uh, of plant yields per plot, okay? So, um, and these are the units are in grams. What is obvious that obviously the, the, the irrigated part of the field, uh, we got uh, bigger yields, okay? And the, the, the non-irrigated part, but still, you know, now I'm, I'm analyzing the data because, uh, you know, there are some promising varieties right there. Some of them, are there coming back from the ones that uh, we put in Akron that we saw already last year. So it's good that Jason and I did a good job by taking just notes without data and selecting these varieties for, for, for Akron because some of them, including that Portuguese one, are coming up again in the dry part, you know, and the non-irrigated part as the best performing ones. Others, we did a bad job and this year didn't produce very well, didn't produce very well in Akron, didn't do very well here with once you have the data in hand. So the good thing is that now, with this new data set, I can be looking the next week, I'm gonna see with him and we're gonna analyze the data and see, okay, which varieties are promising here and could be evaluated in replicated trials in, in 2021. So that's what's gonna happen next. 
Okay, and just says to conclude, um, some acknowledgement. I have to acknowledge a lot of people, and I mean, a lot of people at CSU have great colleagues. Uh, I think I didn't mention Barry and Rick, they have been also really, really helpful. Uh, um, uh, also, the, the, the WIT program, really, I mean, the, the all uh, the previous uh, WIT breeder, uh, Scott Haley, the new breeder, Stan uh, Mason, all the people working in that program, really, really helpful. They have been even setting, honestly, I cannot thank them enough, in setting equipment with me because I don't have any equipment. And, and the previous, you know, the, not a lot of equipment in, in Ardec for, for, for beans, really. So threshing was really difficult and they ended up, you know, I ended up using their the thresher. So I'm really thankful to them for that. And also to my previous colleague at the University of California Riverside for, you know, bringing seeds. <laughs> That's really, really helpful and I think it can help uh, Colorado farmers and and, uh, and of course Jason has been a great collaborator and friend and the funding of course funding so NSF Bread uh, has funded uh, the sequencing of, of cowpea and all the new varieties sequence of new varieties and I also um, uh, thanks to the to the Colorado Driving Administrative Committee because of the you know the money it gave me for travel and also it has funded some of the ARDEC trials all the, um, um, the entire um, Akron uh, trial is funded by the College of Agricultural Sciences, the program solutions to crop commodity challenges. And also thank you to Trinidad Benham uh, Corporation, who has also, which has also uh, provided some support to my program. Okay. And with that, I want to thank you for the attention and I'm, I hope the, the talk was interesting and useful for you. So thank you. Thank you very much, Maria.